Hey, uh, welcome to another episode of, uh, of our forums where we bring uh, different black professionals across industry on this platform to discuss various topics. Uh, this week, we're joined by uh, uh, professionals within the engineering field, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of your perspectives and insights. And I'll just start off with the introductions and I'll take this to Kwame now. Well, my name is Kwame Ben Eden, and I am a Ryerson trained civil engineer. I was uh, fortunate to get also my professional designation. I've never really worked in engineering design um, since leaving Ryerson 20, what, 23 years ago. I spent a bit of time in consulting engineering in the building science area, but most of my time has been spent in construction management. And the bulk of that was as a site super and now in my later years, I'm a project manager with a major um, commercial real estate developer. Okay, thanks for the introduction there, Kwame. Uh, we'll move over to uh, Matthew. Hi, so uh, my name is Matthew Davis. I'm a professional engineer, civil engineering. Um, about my 20, 20th or 21st year in the business. Um, Currently work at um, you know major city um, in the GTA doing transportation engineering and planning. Um, prior to that, I worked for various consulting firms uh, for about you know, twelve years or so before going into the public sector. Thank you, and I appreciate the introductions, there, gentlemen. And uh, my name is Kevin. I'm a management consultant and um, I'm the founder of Kamau Consulting Group, where we focus on a strategic approach to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And specific to this uh, forum, we bring different uh, Black professionals together to discuss uh, unique uh, experiences that are facing Black professionals within an industry. And we've had, uh, this is our 15th episode, we've had many professionals come onto this forum and we've discussed various issues, various challenges within those sectors. And I'm keen to hear some of your insights and perspectives on this uh, forum today. So without further ado, I'll just jump into uh, the agenda that we uh, set out for the forum. And I'll start off by asking, um, you know, what are some of the, or rather at least consider, what are some of the challenges you have faced in your journey as a black professionals or as a black professional in or interacting within engineering? And I'll take this back to uh, Kwame. Man, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I, I recognize uh, the um, the experience there uh, with respect to both of you within your industries. Uh, more or less just a summary, um, hitting some of the highlights. We only have one hour on this forum, so, <laughs> and we got to cover uh, those five specific um, items we centered on this forum. So I guess, uh, you know, take as much time as you want to uh, explain your experiences. Uh, on a high level, I guess, summarize and uh, we can take it on from there because we're going to have a chance to unpack some of those experiences as we go through the questions. Well, I've, uh, as I said uh, at the outset, I've been at this in this business for 23 years and most of it has been in construction management. And uh, if I didn't have the scholar, I wouldn't be a project manager today. I'd be a VP of either... Um, uh, field operations, and I'd be a senior VP of construction somewhere. Um, the last place I work was called um, Penalta Group. And the owner came to give me a review. And he said, you know, he was acting as the owner and as the VP of field operations. And he said, uh, you should be doing my job. But he knew that he had guys with him for 15, 16 years. And if you get to me, then, you know, in this business, you meet people that are engineers that are actually site, site supers and even project managers. And um, it's almost impossible for them to step out of themselves and see in, in a role of leadership. As a person of color, I have to have a completely different leadership style. I have to lead white men in a way that they don't even recognize that I'm leading them. I'm leading them from the rear. Even the, the laborers that I have in construction, they're the first to disrespect me. 
right? I need a laborer. I can get them fired. I can get every laborer, every sub trade that worked for me fired. I can get them off my job. Don't come back here. But you get zero respect. And uh, at the management level, being a person in the field, they don't remember that you're there, but you're so integral to the success of every project. You, you could have the best project manager in the world and a, and a sloppy site super and the job fails. But if you have a sloppy project manager and a good site manager, the job's not going to fail. And that's been my experience because they don't, they're not used to working with somebody like me who has an engineering background so I just don't know why something is done. I know how it is done now. So I went to school and they taught me the why. And after 23 years, I know how it is done. And I'm not being uh, hard to hear to use that word, but I know my stuff. But they're not, they cannot see past the color. They cannot see past the fact that you have the ability to do this thing. And if, I, if they make me lead, they will only, they only be 10 times better because now you're giving somebody who has the ability to train the next people coming up. This is the right way to do this. This is the correct approach. What I've tried to do with working is once I got a system that worked, I don't change it. I do the same thing the same way every time. It's almost impossible to make a mistake. You're going to start the building. You call this person first good you call this person second you know and you do it in that methodical approach and it's successful so i find that every single company i've worked every single company i've left after i leave they call me back if i want to come back because there's always that one person that look at you and say, as a black person you shouldn't be able to be that good you shouldn't have that position you shouldn't be making this amount of money and i'm going to end by giving you one short example so a friend of mine became successful and he started a construction company and when I got to 40 years old, I said to him, you know, I am comfortable in my skin enough, now I'm mature enough that I can come and work for you. So I started working for him and he himself created a very toxic environment and also the folks under him or under me felt that I had an inside track to him. So what they would do if something happens in the field or so we had some interaction, they would try to get to him first, thinking that I am actually getting to him and talking negative things about them. That was, but that was far from the truth. So it happened that I'm leaving. I said, I had enough of this, I'm leaving. And we sat down at this table to discuss my departure. And he said, let me tell you something. I had a meeting with all the senior staff and I had them write everybody's name on a paper that were working for me. And I said, if the company is going down, me and my brother is staying, but everybody else is expendable. I want you to strike off the person's name who I should let go in the first round. Everybody strike off my name. Get rid of him, get rid of him, good. So he got the paper back and he said, uh, if the person is hardworking, knowledgeable, trustworthy, have the best interests of the company at heart, put them back on the sheet. Everybody put my name back on the paper. So I'm asking you, why was my name taken off? Was it because I was not capable? Was it because I didn't have the best interests of the company at heart? Or was it just because as a person of color, I shouldn't be there? And I must hasten to add that most of those guys were my classmates. I went to school with them. I know them for almost now 27 years, right? But they in themselves can't see past the fact that I'm a person of color. I shouldn't be in that role. Well, I stand uh, passed over to somebody else. Thanks, uh, thanks for explaining that, Kwame. I appreciate uh, you uh, you sharing that experience. Um, I mean, I'm going to unpack some of that as we go through the questions. Matthew, right. your experience? Yeah, I think um, the first there's a lot of uh, similarities between my my career and and uh, Kwame's because I mean I think we're both civil engineers, and so you run in the same circles when it comes to the classmates, um, the, the, even in the roles that you end up getting uh, over time. So uh, when I started out, um, I, I'm not a construction engineer, I'm, I'm civil design and again, planning, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's a little bit different, but not too much different. Um, it's well known, um, I, I went to school in the United States, I'm from the United States originally, 
Uh, I've been here about 10 years, but it's well known that no matter whether you're here in Canada or the United States, if you're in a civil engineering program and you're black, uh, you're an ultra minority, right? There's, there's very few uh, <laughs> civil engineers of color. Um, I think over time, and I mean, since I've been in the, in the business, I feel like representation has increased in engineering overall, yes. but civil and building and the construction trades, uh, it just hasn't, it hasn't taken off in that, in that way. And so uh, my experience is slightly different, but I, I again, I, I don't even want to repeat everything he said because uh, like his experience is very much, uh, very much similar to mine. What I will say though, is that I find um, there's, a, there's a couple, I guess, differences when you're in the pre-construction work as opposed to uh, what Kwame does in the construction. In pre-construction, you, you, if you're fortunate enough, first of all, to make it to a level where you get to be in the room deciding on planning decisions and major decisions that inform some of the field work and the construction work, um, there is that, that you know, um, you're, you're in there by yourself in terms of being person of color. Uh, you do get the questions, to be perfectly honest, um, like if I hadn't grown my beard in, I think people wouldn't even look at me, uh, you know, <laughs> one or two different ways, right? Because they would think, oh, he's black and he's young. He doesn't, he doesn't know anything, right? Uh, so thank COVID for that, right? But, you know, all jokes aside, um, it's, it's a shame because um, while everyone's in there, you, you, what, you, what you see is that a lot of these decisions are being made without representation for the people who the decisions are impacting the most. And that you see that whether you're in the United States, you're in Canada, um, and it becomes quite disheartening when it comes to you feeling like you're making a difference. I mean, that's what most of us in engineering, we get into it for, right? We know math, we know science, we're trying to use what we know to make a difference in the world, right? I mean, that's generally, I mean, we could describe it in a bunch of different ways. So to see that no matter how high you get, no matter how, which tables you sit at, that you are the only one most of the time. And then that, you know, there's a, there's a responsibility that comes with that, that I think, uh, I'll just be blunt, like if you're a white engineer, you don't carry, like you don't carry as a white engineer, the responsibility to represent your entire community and other communities of color for that matter at any of these tables. That's a huge responsibility. I take it on proudly, to be honest. I, I feel like if I don't do it, there's not a lot of people who will do it. But is that something that I went to school for? Is that something that I really got into engineering for to be you know, representing all these folks? You know, Maybe, maybe not, but it's nonetheless, it's an expectation. And here's the thing, if you can't do it, now here, here's the trick about that. If you can't be that representative voice, your voice overall gets sort of minimized and, and reduced, right? Because a lot of people are looking to you as the brown person in the room, right? To represent all these sort of uh, difference of opinions and uh, perspectives. And if you can't offer that, then your value seems to go somewhat south. And, and, that's a, and how, do you, how do you reconcile that if you're, you know, with a, you know, if you're a white engineer, you don't have to represent all of you know Europeans, uh, you know uh, opinions on everything, right? It's just a different, it's a different expectation, and um, you know I'll gladly take it on, but I, I think it does add on to it, and it's very hard to uh, to uh, communicate that to people who are trying to come up in the business, right? When you're you're just now starting, do you really want to tell a black undergraduate civil engineer, oh yeah, by the way, when you make it to the top or even to the middle, you're going to have to represent everybody you know, and every time you say something, right? You have to be, you know, super correct every time because the minute you make one mistake, right? It's you, all the brown folks that you know and everybody you went to school with are totally horrible and you're, and you, you know, you're not worth it. So I'll, I'll stop there. There's a, a lot we could unpack with that as well, but uh, I just wanted to offer a different perspective because Kwame's perspective is is dead on from, from even my experience. So, but I'll pass it on, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, that's uh, very similar experiences. And I must say that all professions that we've had on this platform have similar experiences. Uh, I mean, when you speak, uh, you're speaking on behalf, more or less for the most part, it feels like you're speaking for your community. So I can understand how that impacts everyone. Personally, for myself, I'm not really in engineering, but my background is uh, largely, uh, my background is in business. 
and I spent many years as a, in leadership development and organization development uh, for one of the largest corporations here in Canada. And when I left the corporate world, I started a management consulting firm because I wanted to change some of those narratives that I'd experienced. And uh, that was largely uh, driven mm -hmm. by the fact that I was, all, I was always the, uh, the only guy in the room. So I, I just want to make sure that um, uh, we're, we're trying to capture as many experiences as we can. And uh, I'll, I'll allow uh, Ronald to make his introductions. Um, and we're simply uh, uh, introducing ourselves, Ronald, and uh, we are going through the first uh, question that we have here, which is simply um, to see if you can explain some of the challenges you face in your journey as a Black professional in uh, or interacting well, with in, uh, engineering. Yeah, uh, ple pleasant good evening, everyone. Uh, apologies. You guys can hear me, right? Yeah, we can, bro. Yeah. Uh, apologies for being a bit late. I was trying to sort out. I actually got a contract with an engineering firm in the States in New York and was trying to sort out my PayPal thing because that's maybe one of the, um, they have another system, but we don't use it in Canada. Um, a little bit about my, my background. I'm Jamaican, so born, raised in Jamaica. I studied my engineering in Jamaica. I migrated to Canada when I was 29 years old. Uh, most of my, um, in terms of experience prior to coming to Canada, is in oil and gas industry. I used to work at the oil refinery in Jamaica as an instrumentation and electrical engineer technologist. And um, my engineering is specific to um, electronics and process control, instrumentation process control. And then I, that's my diploma. And then I had to work for two years and did a part time. Uh, three year one they call it day release program to do my complete my degree. Um, so I have what is called a bachelor's of engineering because with my degree, at the end of my degree, I have five years industrial experience. That's what qualifies you for that degree. To, um, it's an experience. So I have what is called a bachelor's of engineering. My bachelor's is in electronics and how electronics and telecom. Um, but for the, most of my work in this work, work life, I've always been involved in controls, um, instrumentation process controls, um, indoor environmental controls. So that's where I get connected to the whole construction and building industry and um, transition from indoor environmental into um, energy management and project management. Uh, so I do a lecture part-time at the University of Toronto. I lecture project management in the school of continuing studies. Um, so the first thing that got me when I came here was, um, which was I, I was naive to because I grew up in Jamaica. So what we have is more class prejudice, right? right. It's more your name is Caldwell and you're associated right. with the Caldwells and the Caldwell going to clean the hotels. And, you know, it, it wasn't so much a color of your skin, <laughs> right? And then most of that used to be aligned with the lighter color people too, right? And the, Indian people, the Chinese, a little bit because of how it was struck. So I wasn't exposed Lebanese, to it. Brother. Don't forget yeah. the, Leban so, eh? the Don't Lebanese. Forget Lebanese, Jamaicans. Yeah, yeah, Lebanese, Syrian. We had a Syrian oh, prime Syrian, minister. Right. Yeah, we had a Syrian prime minister at one point. People didn't know that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but I grew up where my doctor can be brown, Indian, white, black. My prime minister, my member of parliament, my fellow engineers, my teachers can be from all, even my last name is, I have a old English name, first name, an old English middle name, and a Scottish last name. So, so my experience coming to Canada was my first interview, uh, one of the first jobs I applied for, the guy asked me to send me his res send, send in my resume. I showed up, there were uh, two white guys sitting across um, in the lobby and uh, in the, the reception area and I was sitting on the other side and the guy came out with the resume and he's looking at the white guy. He said, Ronald Caldwell. <laughs> he's saying, Ronald Caldwell. And he's looking at the guy and saying, I'm over here. <laughs> and you could see the change in the body language, the facial expression, everything. And for that 10 or 15 minutes I was in that interview, all this guy was telling me is why you think I cannot do the job. 10, 15 minutes. He could never look me in the eye. And after that, I just said, you know, what? Um, he was saying, um, if you want, we can, um, you know, give us a couple of weeks and we'll, I said, no, no, it's okay. And I took my resume from him. 
I said, it's fine, right? But even then, I I was still naive to racism. I didn't grow up in racism. You know, you watch the TV, what's happening in the US and all that, but I didn't grow up in that, right? You get, someone might get hired or get promoted about because they're friends with someone. So it's just more, or they're related to someone, but it's not, you know, that type of thing. So been here for 20 years, um, come July will be 20 years since I've lived in Canada. Been here for 20 years, I've been to every different type of systemic racism that you can think of in the corporate world. I've been to bare-faced, blunt racism <laughs> in, this in the corporate world. And the only thing that they could never ever do to me is because sometimes I was ignorant to it, didn't know that what was it, what that was what it is, because when you don't grow up in something, it takes a while for you to recognize that's what it is. When they hire someone who has a, in, a diploma in interior design and put them as your manager, <laughs> to, to <laughs> professional engineers reporting to a white lady with a diploma <laughs> in interior design. <laughs> You know, it takes a, it takes a while for you to recognize that's what it is, right? Um, you know, it always just you know we're doing this arg reorg and all that, all sort of excuses. And then when you, one of the, my biggest thing that I face, and I face it everywhere, even at the university as well. I'll just read this. Uh, I mean, they've done a lot to try to correct it because I'm at this stage now where once I see that, call it out. I don't care. <laughs> I'm gonna call it out and who has to deal with it, deal with it. But I I'm not I don't have to deal with it. After I say what it is and show you what it is, I know I don't have to deal with it. So this is one of the things I'm trying to get our fellow black professionals to know that when you see it, call it out. They can't do you anything. And you don't have to deal with it. Because once you call it out, you don't have nothing else to do with it. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you two of my pre recent experience. One of the main thing I challenged, faced with, I'm known for making organizations millions of dollars. I'm with CBRE. You can see it on my thing if I send in my resume. $14 million in the last eight years. I've saved the Canadian, the Ontario government, because my client is the government of Ontario. I'm known as the guy who, I'm customer service amb ambassador. I'm the guy who, when you have a difficulty with a customer, <laughs> you call Ron Paul, right? Um, he's gonna explain the technical stuff in a simple manner that everybody will understand. <laughs> he can do, he's the guy who is able to, and one of the things that I learned, uh, fortunately when I was in Jamaica and coming, coming up, I, it was just, it came to me naturally is uh, influencing without our thought. So I mastered the art of influencing without authority. I can get people in Ottawa to spend millions of dollars, right? And I have no authority over them, but I can influence them to do stuff. And as a result, you join organizations. A lot of people try to put you up front to be the face to deal with the clients and get clients and stuff like that. But one of the things that I've observed is when it's time for me to get what my share, there is this question of deservingness. And I'm sure you guys have experienced Experience that too, right? It is okay for you to work hard and you, you know, because when they see our color, they see work. That's what they see. They see work, you know, it's from slavery coming all the way down. And guys, black is work. So they'll give you all the work and we're always trying to prove ourselves. Even when we're not proving ourselves, it comes across as we're proving ourselves because we hold ourselves to higher standards than others, right? Because of how we have to fit into it organization. But I find every time when it comes on to what my deservingness, my share, there's always a question. There's always something that let you recognize that they don't think you deserve it. They don't think you deserve the salary. They don't think you deserve the bonuses. They don't think you deserve certain things. And it becomes evident. And it's evident from in my experience working here for 20 years, that is always it, right? The other thing is, I sit on the other side of the fence. Most of my career as a professional is me. I'm on the side of the client who's paying for the work to be done. So as a result, 
I'm the one who's reviewing the design consultant. I'm the one who is providing um, feedback and guidance to design consultant, engineer consultant. Well, you are you all know who that goes, right? The one black guy sitting over you telling all these white, especially the civil guys, <laughs> what do you want to do? <laughs> what do you should be doing? <laughs> right? And I've butted with a lot, I've got into a lot of conflict with some, and even up to about was it six months ago, I got one organization actually fired a guy. Because what he didn't know is that we're on this call if Kevin was to cut me off, there's a message that comes up on my screen that says the host has removed you from the meeting. So I was in a meeting and I'm, I'm because I'm a project manager as well, I was, there was a change request and they were talking about, I don't want to go on too long, but they were talking about some alarm system for the, for the fire alarm system, which are speakers. And this is a correction institution with a, with a court attached to it. And they were saying that they're talking about the change. And I said, how many speakers are we talking about? And they said, well, 120. And I'm like, but was there a mandatory site visit during the bidding, the tender process? They said, yes. So I said, how do you miss 120 speakers? <laughs> they're in the ceiling, right? You walk the building, they're in the ceiling, right? <laughs> so, so I started asking questions. I'm like, so 120? So I said, how many speakers are in the building? <laughs> so they said, well, with the 120, about 300. So I said, well, what do you miss 120? So they were telling me that they didn't have access to certain places when they went because of court and session and all that. And they didn't have it to the estimate. They didn't put an estimate in. So I said, oh. so they were telling me how they're going to correct it because now the speakers, they have to cut the wall, drywall. And they were saying, okay, we're just going to use a bigger speaker rather than a four inch, we're going to use a six inch so we don't have to do patchwork and all that. So they're explaining to me. So they're explaining. And then I said, well, um, so who's going to pay for this? So the project manager, <laughs> he got upset. Oh, we're not, we're not going to spend all day on this. And wait. So I said, no, no, I'm not. We're not spending all day. They're telling me what they're going to do. And he got upset and cut me off the phone. Cut me, yeah. I, I was going to let it slide. And I thought about it and said, you know what? Sick and tired of this bullshit. Because it has happened so many times, so many times. Now I got to a point where personally, I don't care how people feel. I don't care how people want to react. That's not on me. You treat me a certain way, I'm going to call it out. You go deal with it, <laughs> right? Because yeah. I treat everyone with respect. When I join an organization, and one of the other things I've experienced from working in this country, if I'm a part of your team, I became the, they, they have me as like the standard for getting along with people. So if you join the team, everybody observes how you get along with me. Ten of us on the team, but you're being observed as to how you get along with Ron. Because if you can't get along with Ron Caldwell, you guarantee you're not going to be there for long. Thank, thanks for sharing that, uh, yeah. Ron. Um, yeah. <clears throat> in the interest of time, and thanks for sharing the, um, you know, the experiences uh, in your journey there. Um, I'm going to jump into the second question. Um, I mean, you've sure. answered a majority of it anyway with the experiences. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'll take this back to um, Kwame. I mean, based on your experience, I mean, what are the, I said three, but we'll keep it down to two. What are the top two bears that are unique to Black professionals in engineering and some possible solutions? If we can just maybe aim for about maybe five minutes each to mm -hmm. discuss maybe the top two bears, that would help us in covering at least the uh, the other questions, I think the, uh, the other three questions. So, top two sorry, barriers. I, sorry, I said barriers, right? Barriers? Top two barriers, I think. Barriers, okay. Yeah, top, top two barriers, yeah. Barriers. You've already discussed some of them in, your, in, your, mm -hmm. um, in some of the experiences you've shared, um, especially in your journey um, <clears throat> working in Canada and in that field. Um, so I'll take this back to Kwame because you've, you've answered a majority of number mm -hmm. two, so um, and we flip on number three, we'll let you go first. So, uh, I don't know, outside of say your color and the fact that um, you're not expected to be represented at the table, 
So you get a lot of raised eyebrows when you get put at the table. And uh, I think that those are, in my opinion, to the biggest barriers in the sense that one, your color, and number two, you shouldn't be here. So you're under a lot of scrutiny. And the other guys can attest, when your counterpart can make a mistake, you have to be done right perfect all the time. I remember uh, working for a construction, construction and engineering firm, and we were doing a retrofit to a live manufacturing facility. Actually, we're doing Dr. Utker. Now that facility, they made tapioca. And what we didn't know is that tapioca uh, is like baking soda or baking powder, powder, sorry. Is it baking soda? It's baking soda. Baking soda, if you put it in your fridge, it absorbs the scent of whatever is in there. So tapioca does the same thing. Yeah. And um, so we got ready to demolish one side of the warehouse. We're gonna take down, they had a, a suspended slab. We're gonna take it out and put a racking in there. So we put a barrier up from floor to ceiling and uh, we're ready to start. And we had to start cutting and we had all uh, diesel powered equipment and the shop steward come in and said, what are you doing? You gotta, you gotta take this all out. We, you can only use electric equipment. In here. And uh, anyhow, it led to us um, coming up with, I, I, I said that you should pay for mon particulate monitoring um, where you monitor the air quality on the side where we're working Mm -hmm. and you move the air quality on the side that we're not working so we can judge before and after um, air, air quality so that if, because you know, manufacturing plants, everything is time stamped. Anyway, long and short of it, I had to go up against the senior VP of the, government <laughs> of the company I work for. I had to go up against the manufacturing plant um, uh, general manager and it went to the boss of my company. And the way I explained to him, it was just hands down that he paid it. I said, look, Andrew, you pay me every two weeks and I spend the check before I get it. If you don't pay $4,000 to monitor this particular, if we are in here working and the scent from what we're doing, get into this tapioca and Johnny's mother in Brazil is making a tapioca pudding pie, and when it's baked that it tastes and it tastes of gasoline or diesel fuel or whatever it is, they're gonna sue the pants off you. Well, I'll be on to the next project. I might not even be here at your company mm -hmm. and you'll be paying for this forever. And I was able, based on explaining it like that, able to have him get a particulate monitoring down. So I say color, <clears throat> you're not supposed to be at the table. You're not supposed to have the experience you have. You're not supposed to have the critical thinking skills that you have. And when you present your information, you have to be almost demure. You almost have to be presenting in such a way that you don't ruffle any feathers. Because if you present it with any authority, it's really taken in a bad light. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Um... Yeah. So it's very neat. So you mentioned that uh, you know some of the barriers you face, or rather, at least some of the barriers you, uh, you've experienced are uh, obviously getting your point across to your uh, the leaders, and uh, the fact that there's um, no representation within engineering with people that look like you, um, and um, and I must say, even when I was trying to perform together, it was very difficult trying to find um, engineers, uh, black professionals in engineering. Yep. There are lots of them there, but. Um, I think when people are intentional, they will find them. And uh, if I'm able to find engineers in a matter of span of about two weeks, I'm sure people out there can find engineers if they're really committed to hiring and increasing representation. And so um, this, uh, I would say in, in, in a nice way, this BS of people uh, advocating the fact that there's no pipeline or there are uh, mm -hmm. no black professionals in engineering is a question of, is it intentional or is it they're just not interested. So it brings up a really good point. I'd want to hear your thoughts, Matthew. What are the top two barriers that you think are unique to black professionals in engineering? Yeah, so um, I think I'll come at it from a different angle in the sense that, um, at least for me, um, how do I say? There, I guess if you start young, right, and you start in high school or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whatever schools you, you, you've gone to, um, 
<clears throat> I, I'll just tell you my experience and, that, and then maybe we can just sort of flesh it out. So like when I was in high school um, in the US, we have the, we used to have these things called guidance counselors and they were there and they were supposed to like help you as you're starting to get older in school, start to advise you towards a career or uh, educational path, <clears throat> excuse me, had one of the nicest, nicest guidance counselors in the world. Um, but when I started talking about engineering, the reason why I started talking about engineering as a career, um, well, there's, there's some personal things in there, but um, where I lived, you could tell that um, uh, we lived in a, in, in a town in New Jersey where we had like a, a huge oil refinery and there was a long um, railroad that cut the town in half and the black side was on the south side of the tracks while the school and everything was on the north side of the tracks, right? So that kind of motivated me to do something. So long story short, uh, guidance counselor calls me in. We're talking during my senior year, or and all we're talking. And I said, "Hey, my physics teacher said he really thinks I have some potential to be engineer." And he's like, "Oh, I don't know if you want to do that, you know." And uh, and I said, um, "Well, you know, the physics teacher is telling me I kind of get a good grasp, and you know, I'm taking calculus in high school." So he's like, "You know," he says, "You he really think I have the aptitude for it?" He's like, "Yeah, you know." Um, I haven't really seen a lot of people from your from this town really succeed in you know engineering and those tech fields. Why don't you try something else? You know the fact that I played football in high school also didn't help, right? Because it's like, oh, you could just get a football scholarship and you could just do business or you know phys ed. And I was just like, you got to be kidding me. And I and I'll never forget this one when I said, okay, well, let me just consider engineering. Where do you think I should go to school, right? Because that's their job. They're supposed to recommend like where you could, could apply to. He was like, oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, where do you like to go on vacation? <laughs> and I was like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, my, my family is broke. I didn't go on vacation. So I was like, I don't know, maybe Florida. He was like, go to Florida State. <laughs> and I was just like, so, so what I'm getting at is uh, <laughs> these experiences when you're younger, when you're trying to, you know, if you even have, have any aptitude towards any desire, you know, part of it is that sort of, you know, structural thing that you're dealing with, even at a young level, a young age, right? Like people that are around that will take you seriously, right? And give you the type of advice you need to put you on the right path. So I would say that is a, is a key thing. Like you, we can say structural racism all we want, right? But it starts so young. That it, and again, I, you know, I'm a senior in high school. I had no idea, like this guy had treated me nice all this time. So uh, is he racist? You know, I, I couldn't even say that. But if had I listened to him, right, I'd be playing football in Florida State, you know, probably majoring in swimming. I don't know. I, I guess my, my, my point is, it starts there. And then I think the other part, um, it, it speaks a little bit to what you talked about from the representation bit, which is um, sort of these mentors, right? So so you you graduate and you become an engineer or you, you, gra you have a civil engineering degree or engineering degree where is everybody, right? Um, you, you, you suffer through, you know, like the folks that went to school in Jamaica, like, you know, that's an envious position, right? They be around everybody and everybody's black or brown and everything. Yeah, yeah. But here in North America, you, 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 you get through being that one person in the classroom, you graduate. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, now who do I talk to about my hookup, right? About my job, about the whisper in the ear for <laughs> the first opportunity. And it's very difficult, right? Yeah. So the fact that you have, you found three of us here in a matter of two weeks, I think it's, it's great, but I still, mm -hmm. I, I'm just gonna be honest. I still consider us uh, like black unicorns, right? Yep. Like, we, yep. like we, I think, you, I think <laughs> yeah. Kevin, you should play the lottery because I, I think it's really hard to find a lot of folks who have made it and, and are here to be able to tell the story you know, 10, 20, 30 years after the fact, right? Because it, it really, yeah. it's, I, I've been here 10 years and I can't tell you that I found five engineers like that, that I know that I could speak to about these kind of things in this kind of space. So I, I would say those two things. Hey, thanks for sharing that. And uh, that speaks to a lot of things, uh, especially in the North American context and similar to uh, what most <laughs> people face in the States, uh, we have something similar in Ontario where you know, there's a lot of streaming in uh, high schools and um, just like a, a guidance counselor, you know, mm -hmm. um, schools will um, force students to perhaps consider something else 
uh, especially when they come across black students. If a, a student is considering perhaps pursuing a medical degree or an engineering degree or a business degree, um, they're more or less streamed towards the arts and um, you know, you know, uh, and, and that does not necessarily speak to uh, enhancing representation. And this sometimes is also internalized because it's very difficult to, you can't really perceive what you can see represented. It's very difficult and psychological barriers are everything. Mm -hmm. And like I said, um, it was difficult trying to get uh, black professionals within engineering onto mm -hmm. this panel. Uh, but, um, you know, I was, I was, you know, I, I had a few that responded fairly late, like yourself, I think Matthew and Ron and uh, Kwame was on board early enough, uh, but for the most part, um, I went hard out. And um, there is actually an association of uh, Black professionals in engineering uh, that was uh, formed, I think, about a year or two ago. Um, and um, they are, uh, they do have a website. It's uh, it's a federal, uh, you know, nonprofit organization. And um, I'd encourage uh, every one of you to check it out. I can send it uh, once this form mm -hmm. is done, and uh, you can meet many other. Black professionals in engineering on that space. There's at least a good, I think, three or four hundred listed on there, and I was shocked when I came across it. And um, but then again, it's very encouraging as well. And I'd want to see a lot more of that. And the and the and the, the intention of these forums are simply to provide some type of mentorship for those mm -hmm. people that are aspiring to become uh, uh, to join certain professions, uh, be it engineering. Uh, you know, and and I see three different professionals here in, in within different scopes, be it uh, construction engineering, mm -hmm. civil engineering, and electronic engineering. So the, the possibilities are out there. It's just a matter of making sure mm -hmm. we can keep them connected. And I can certainly understand the structural uh, challenges that we have when it comes to systemic racism, but we have to start being intentional in ensuring that we can connect all these black experiences if you want to see um, the younger generation uh, join these uh, professions. And which will lead me to my third question. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on the roles the following institutions should play? You didn't want me to talk about the barriers, or we're good. <laughs> no, you mentioned some. Oh, okay. No, I do. I mean, you mentioned some of them on on your experiences. Yeah, um, that's fine. That's fine. We'll you mentioned colorism, so I'm going to bring this back onto you, and we're going to go around again because you'd already mm -hmm. mentioned uh, some of the uh, unique experiences that you had faced, mm -hmm. and so um, I'd want to hear what are your thoughts on the roles falling uh, the following institutions should play in addressing barriers faced by black professionals in engineering. And I'm, I'm keen on, uh, I'm, 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 I'm considered with the time here as well. Um, so educational institutions, professional or licensing associations uh, for yourselves, uh, whoever's in charge or the body that's in charge of uh, mm -hmm. providing that, uh, the licensing within engineering and government. So those three institutions, if, if you don't mind just mentioning maybe perhaps one thing that every one of those should perhaps be looking at to, uh, you know, break down the barriers or address the barriers within engineering. I'll take this okay. back to Ron. Okay, so, um, you know, going back to what Matt was saying, I've had my own experience with this, and this is, um, I was working as a better automation system technician, one of the first jobs I had here, and one of the school, one of the project was Burboff College, which was an all boys school, um, Catholic boys school that was being built by, uh, on steels between Bayview and um, Young Street, along there, and I was there doing the systems, uh, programming the systems at my laptop, the controllers are inside the ductwork, but the BAV is inside the ceiling and all that. And the school was about to be open and this was December and it was to open in January. And there was a Polish lady came up to me, said she was a teacher, she was setting up her class and she was saying, what are you doing? And I was telling her, she said, so what, what do you, what I so I said, well, I'm an engineer, but I'm working as a technician because I just came to Canada. And she said, what do you have to do to do this? And I was giving her some experience. She said, can you come and speak to my class? So I said, uh, sure. She asked me if I'm going to be there in January working. I said, yeah, this project is not going to be done. Um, so I went and I was talking to the class. The class was predominantly Black boys, 14-year-olds, 14, 15-year-olds. And when I was telling them, this is what you do to become an engineer, to become an engineer and stuff and get into engineering. I remember after the class was done, one guy, one of the black kids came to me and said, so are you an engineer, like a real engineer? And I said, yeah. He said, he, said he has never, ever seen a black engineer. He has never seen a black engineer. Now, 
at 14, 15 years old, me growing up in Jamaica, I have some tons of engineers, I have some tons of black doctors. And black. So going back to what you were saying, um, Matthew, um, it is a real thing. So when it comes down to the educational institution from high school, colleges, from, you know, I'm gonna go to high school, even uh, middle school. They need to start having programs like what I had in high school. In high school, in grade eight, we had what we call um, uh, career day. So on that day, you have different classrooms set up with, if you wanna be a soldier, there's military guys there, there's engineers there, there's doctors, nurses, auto mechanic, you pilot, and you can go and sit in a forum and, and speak, speak to these people and they will tell you this is what, because we get to select something. Like we start physics from grade nine, but you got to select it in grade eight that you want to do physics in grade nine. So you got to have that knowledge that you need to do physics to become an engineer, right? A lot of the kids here, the same way we live in communities here where we don't know our neighbors and we don't know what our neighbors do, which is totally different from in Jamaica, it's the same thing. So these kids are going, what are they associating with? Well, I'm associated with my cousins and my family friends and some are gangbangers and some. Are... So although they might live in a nice community, they're not exposed to what they can become. So the high school, the guidance council, they, they need to have these type of career based stuff that they can expose the kids. And that's the issue with it, with the education system. Your guidance counselor is someone who went and studied guidance counseling. I've seen it with black kids over and over again. Or they're going to college. What do you study? Kinesiology. Okay. They, they don't know that if you do three more years, you can be the doctor. They don't know that if you're doing kinesiology, you're already studying the whole anatomy and muscular structure. You might as well do nursing or medicine. They don't know if you're doing nursing, you just need to do a couple more years and you're a doctor. You're already at the institution. So even at the tertiary level, they're not telling them or guiding them as to what they can become. And everything is seen as a challenge, right? So one of the things that I was involved with with the Professional Engineering, um, Professional Engineering Association with the Brampton chapter, but I was a part of the ones that was going around to the high schools and having these little sessions where we talk about, this is what you need to become an engineer. And, you know, talk about the different um, disciplines in engineering, the mechatronics, which is the most crazy stuff everybody is into, the mechatronics, right? It's a combination of mechanical and electronics and, you know, and telling them these are the universities, you can go to Waterloo, you can go here, you know? So they're not, the, the education system is not designed and, there is a real, real, real issue with when you're black. I've seen it with my kids. You guys probably seen it with your kids. There's a real problem when they're going to school of being marginalized. It's, it's real, like it's real, it's a real thing, right? I've had a situation where a teacher complain and my report, son's report. He's always talking in class. He's always talking in class. Right? One day I said, who do you talk to? Who are you talking to? Why well, he's talking to Corey? Well, Corey's the white kid. So I call his Corey's mom. Did you get it on his report that he's always talking in class? No. So the two of you talking in class all the time, but it's on his report that he's always talking in class. So there's it's a real marginalized stuff where they're being limited and they're expect what is expected of them, they're guided that way. They're guided in certain way, right? So they're not exposed to it. The exposure to black professionals at the high school level is very, very limited. And it's a real, real problem because you gotta start, you gotta bend the tree from its young, right? And when they get into college and university, that coordination or mentorship and alignment with those who are in, already in the profession needs to be there. In terms of the profession, in terms of the profession, there's a real problem here. So a lot of it has been, um, they've done some stuff to correct it, in terms of the professional engineers of Ontario, but I've had my fair share with that too, right? They had a guy who didn't believe that foreign trained professional engineers are engineers. And for some reason, he believes that the apple, the apple falls at a different acceleration to gra due to gravity in different places of the world. I don't know where he got that from, but, and that was a real problem. That has been eliminated. And now we're seeing more of our color 
trying to be up there, but there is still the, you step into a room, people are, you're of a different standard. I don't know why, but those are some of the, and for the government, the government, um, they're trying to do their part and they're doing it through, they don't want to get their hands dirty. And we all know how the government works, right? So we, we find, you know, agencies like, like similar to what you're doing, Kevin, and they find other areas of how to, to, to support it. But they themselves are not going to come up and say, oh, I'm, we're falling in association for a Black profession. They're not going to do that, right? They're not going to do it. So we have to do it for ourselves. And that's, that's my answer on that. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, if, if we want to see any change, uh, it's got to come from us. It can't come from yeah, anyone else. Yeah. Uh, especially a change that works for, for our community. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to touch on some of the things that you mentioned. Um, and uh, especially with what it, as it pertains to the school system. And um, unfortunately, um, the school experience speaks to the majority, which largely yeah. obscures the reality, the realities of the minorities. And this is in any setting, uh, be it in North America, even even in Europe. And um, the economies in North America, um, especially over the last 20, 30 years have largely been service driven. And uh, a majority of that, uh, that will speak to that experience were actually largely white males. And so what the school started doing <laughs> is introducing uh, guidance or career sessions or career days that would focus largely on the arts. And so um, if you go to an elementary school today, especially here in Ontario, uh, which can be very different right across the landscape in Canada, because obviously there, you know, we have a very highly decentralized education system. So. Um, the experiences in Nova Scotia should be very different in, 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 in Ontario, but similar. Um, you're going to have uh, career days where you're going to have police officers come in or firefighters come in and all the others. And then when you look at people who are perhaps uh, invested in STEM and other subjects, they're largely missing within the school education system or are not really afforded the opportunity because the schools are responding to the majority, which is obscuring the Black experience. Because Mm -hmm. um, while the service sector or the service driven economy largely benefited white males, uh, Old uh, white black males. people were left behind. Mm -hmm. And so when they changed the school system to accommodate the arts to come in and speak on career days, then the people that were being left behind were the people that were never addressed to begin with, mm -hmm. which was all non white folks, the indigenous communities, the black people, mm -hmm. the yeah. South Asian community, and so forth. And so um, it's not really necessarily benefiting us today because um, as you can see, a majority of us are still largely underrepresented in mm -hmm. careers uh, in engineering in, uh, or in STEM in general, or uh, you, know, you name it. And um, there's a way that we can rectify this. And the only way we can do this is if we become part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And the intention of these forms is to ensure that people can understand that there are black professionals in almost every single scope. Um, yep. And if we can enhance representation and people are able to see it, then that, that could be perhaps the, uh, the inclination for a young kid somewhere that maybe, that maybe wanted to become an engineer just like Matthew that mm -hmm. is being you know, pushed towards Florida mm -hmm. State by the guidance counselor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> we need to do a lot more of that because the mentorship is lacking because you can only imagine if, if Matthew had, you know, Going sideways with this guidance counselor, you can only imagine where you'd be today, right? And so I'd want to hear your thoughts, uh, Kwame, and then we'll go to um, Matthew. So, what are your thoughts on the roles institutions should play in addressing barriers faced by Black professionals at education institutions, professional licensing associations, and government? Well, uh, like Ron, uh, I too, I'm a Jamaican and I too uh, came here. Uh, a bit younger than him, 10 years younger than him. So I had to go back to high school here. Um, when you're from the Caribbean or even from Africa per se, you come from an environment or a culture where everybody look like you. So my earliest rec um, remembrance of going to the doctor, my doctor, actually my doctor was an Olympian, Dr. Arthur Wint. He was probably <laughs> one of the first Jamaicans to get a medal at the Olympics in the 60s, I think it was, yeah. or 50s. You should know of him, Ron. Yeah, yes, so even yes. my district in Hanover, 
So there you go. My doctor is black. The drug, the guy that run the drug store is actually PJ Patterson's brother, mm -hmm. Mr. Pat, right? Yeah. Mr. Pat in my my community was the brother of the that who became his brother became the prime minister of Jamaica. I subsequently met that man here. So what I'm alluding to is when you're from an environment where everybody is black and you're used to seeing black profession, it's not a stretch for you to say, well, I want to be this. Precisely. Yeah. Um, before I came here, I got a job in, an, in a structural engineer's office in Jamaica as a draftsman and everybody's black. The, the engineer that's running is black and we're working on some big projects in Jamaica is black. All the draftsmen are black. All everybody I'm interacting with is black. You know, I was I was on road to go to Cass. It was called Cass when I was there. Now it's UTEC. Yeah. All That's the it's in, it's in the <laughs> right. So I think what is needed in the educational arena here is to bring in black professionals to a lot more career days. I was I had the fortune. I was fortunate enough. I had the fortune to go to Central Tech here. And Central Tech did a very good job at showing black representation. So Black History Month, you have, that's how I know about, so for example, Benjamin Banneker. His picture was on the wall in Black History Month, right? So they let you feel that the, what white people say to us all the time is that you, you, you didn't make any um, contribution to history. You don't see yourself in the pages of history, right? You don't know about, as I said, the Benjamin Banneker of the world or, you know, the real McCoy, where did that really come from? Or Metzlinger, who came up with a shoe last thing. There's so much that we have contributed that somebody tells you, you don't, you didn't do anything. So we need to bring in the professionals in the education system. So they know that they're there in terms of the licensing um, organizations. For, I can talk for PEO. PEO does nothing for us. It collects my fee. It gives me my stamp. If I'm going to stamp things, I need a certificate of authorization. You go through them. Otherwise, you don't even know they're there. Yeah. So they need to have more representation. We need to know what they do for us, what kind of advocacy they're doing, how they advocate with the government. If you advocate with the government, government brings in legislation. So if PEO is saying to the government, look, we have 100,000 members in Ontario, and there's 3% that are Black, but the Black population in Ontario is 10%, then we are underrepresented. Government, you need to do something to get more Black representation in our um, organization. So when it, in regards to the government, as I said, again, the government needs to get in, in the legislate. I think the legislative branch of the government needs to address the licensing organization and to some degree, um, the educational organizations, vis-a-vis uh, -vis either it is the pipeline from the high school that gets you into the university and then at the university level, however they can adjust legislation that gets more of us represented. I'm not saying that we need to go there with less qualification, but somehow open up <coughs> the universities. And in closing, I'm gonna say one thing, when I was at Ryerson, we got a hold of this organization in the state called NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers. And we had, a, we were chartered to be, a, we had a charter. We did charter, they had to charter you and then you have a NSBE, uh, you know, Martin knows about this, a NSBE group at Ryerson. And we were under Buffalo. Let me tell you something, brother. When you go to these events, every year in your body stand up. When you go to the national events, there is, mm -hmm. 30,000, I say it again, 30,000 black engineers of all different, everything you can think of in engineering. I remember we were in upstate New York and we were at a, a conference and so we we're all in the elevator going down. And so, you know, young black men and mm -hmm. everybody wear a suit. You don't, you just can't show up there with your pants hanging out, you know, so we all suit and tie up and in the elevator and these white people come in and they say, what are you guys doing? They were, they were beside themselves impressed yeah. because I don't know if it's our color, but when we put on a suit, you give a white guy or a white woman the same clothes that we wear and we put it on, we are banging. You know it is. Yeah, you know, yeah. they put on a suit, they don't shine their shoes. We yeah. put on a suit, your shoes well shined, your tie is well straight. Like everything about you just brings that stuff out. We were, I'm telling you, they were beside themselves. 
they couldn't believe that a we are young men and we're going to an engineering conference in that hotel that's just over 10,000 strong right so this it's a whole part of <clears throat> the educational institution bringing in more black professionals exposing the students at the youngest stage age saying yes you can do it here's what it looks like as a black professional and you're bringing the people that are in their 20s early 20s so they they're a closer age relation me i'm in my 50s they're not relating with me so i might not mm -hmm. have such a big impact on them as a 24 year old new grad has his first or second job and has some mm -hmm. weight on to need him bringing in the licensing people so that they um the younger people know what it is to be licensed what's a what's the process of getting licensed and when you have your license what it does for you and then the licensing people getting to government so legislation can be changed thanks for sharing that um i'd want to hear your thoughts matthew uh, anything to add to that sure and, I, and i'm cognizant of the time so I'll, I'll try to just get to the point i think to echo you know some of the comments i hear today um there's I'll just say, I think there has to be some intentionality behind diversity in all of those levels, right? Like whether it's educational or government or licensing. And I, and I just, I'll say it, I'm trying to be quick with it, but I'll, I'll try to, I'll make the point. Um, there is nothing, you know, what I find, and this is just my experience being uh, from the US and coming here to Canada. What I see is that there's been, and you know, it's my opinion. I feel like the, the black experience here has been underplayed tremendously in Canada. And I'm not sure why, because I'm not from here, right? Like I've only been here 10 years, I've been seeing it. But, you know, when you compare uh, the struggles that have gone on in Canada for Black people to have rights and do everything that we're, we are supposed to do just like everyone else, to the fight that you had in the US back in the, you know, 60s and whatnot, obviously it's a bit different. And I, I, I bring it up because in the United States, right, you have things like affirmative action, right? You have things like um, minority business enterprise uh, set-asides and all, you know, for big contracts, you know? And we don't have that here. And when I came here, I, I was told the reason why we don't have it is because, well, everybody gets along in Canada. There's no reason to have any sort of uh, arrangements that way because everyone's succeeding and everyone's thriving. I, and I've been here long enough to see that is not the case, right? And so the, the question is, how do we get all of these levels, whether it's educational, whether it's you know the licensing, whether it's um, any of these organizations to bring diversity into their DNA or into their bylaws or into somewhere something where it's no longer a choice to do it. It's actually a metric that you get measured by that you're doing it right, right? Or that you're progressing in a certain way. And, and I, I feel like, um, for example, like, so the licensing uh, agencies, right? Um, there, shouldn't there be something in our bylaws that say that, you know, the, the you know, engineering, as you said, Kevin, it's, it's a service, right? And so, you know, it, and it's a pub, and it, we regulate ourselves, right? Like the PEO is a self-regulating body given that power by Ontario. So the question is, shouldn't that body of people that are providing that service reflect the communities they serve, right? that diversity should be there, but we don't, I mean, I can, you know, I'm sure I can ask the others on the panel, there's nothing in the PEO uh, codes or ethics or anything like that, that even says anything close to that, right? School-wise, it's the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. You see some of the engineering schools here, obviously they don't have the same, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, affirmative action things like the United States does, right? I get that, but I can tell you here, when I went to, I actually went to, uh, so Kwame, I actually went to a Nesby uh, meeting here at U of T, right? Because right. I, I, you know, I'm not that far. And I was like, I'm just curious. I just want to chime in. And they were creating an alumni chapter around here, right? And so we're talking. And for the first time, I'm hearing people tell me that diversity by certain university standards here, and I won't call anybody out, um, when, they, I, when they pursue diverse candidates, it's like folks from India, or folks from you know certain parts of Asia or the Middle East, yeah, and, it's, yeah. and I got to be honest, this is the first time I ever heard anything like that because I'm not saying it doesn't happen in the U.S., but we definitely have things. And I'm not saying the U.S. is perfect by no means, 
But what I'm saying is there's some intentionality behind admissions, behind scholarships to target black people, right? Yeah. And so I don't see that here. And it's, it's always thrown under this rug of, uh, oh, we're all together. Right, right, right. Diversity. Right? Diversity. <laughs> so, so I could go on, but I, I think I made the point. It's just, there's, there's, there's a, there's a uh, sort of concept of diversity that I think is, is, is well-believed and understood here. And then there's the intentionality and the actual like um, operationalizing it that I think needs to take place on all those levels that you mentioned, Kevin, because without that, we're gonna, you're gonna call this forum in another year and we're gonna be sitting exactly the same way, right? And I, I think the last thing I'll close out with is, um, cause I, I see this on a lot of ends. Uh, you're doing a good job, obviously. I, I checked, took a look at your webpage, Kevin. So, you know, you're very consistent in these forums, so this is great. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people coming onto the bandwagon now, right? The George Floyd thing, you know, and all these other things that have been happening in the United States. And what I want to avoid, and this is why I say we got to get the diversity thing in the DNA and in bylaws and in people's sort of intentions and, and just regulations, is because I've been around long enough. I may, I may not be as old as some of the other panelists, but I've been, along long, been around long enough to know that these things pass, right? you'll get a death, you'll get some tragedy and people will motivate and we're always reactionary, right? But then once the fad changes, we're back to square one. So if we don't take advantage of getting into these things now, it won't ever change. Yeah. Absolutely right. Uh, and thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's, these things only last only for so long. And um, uh, when it comes to uh, the Canadian context um, and, uh, you know, um, the policy has been largely ineffective. Um, in Canada, decided to, uh, at the federal level at least, decided to classify uh, groups into four specific groups when it comes to disadvantages. And so that's simply uh, visible minorities, that's anyone that's not white. And then um, you have uh, indigenous peoples, then you have women, and you have people living with disabilities. Um, obviously that just never worked. It's been around since I believe the 80s and has not worked has been in Ontario, has been in Ontario for a long time, for a longer time, and has largely been ineffective because um, we've all seen um, the disadvantages of not really understanding the, in, the intersections uh, across identities, uh, be it a black person or be it uh, an indigenous person, what are the intersections between those two people and so forth. And so um, to your point again, I believe uh, nothing is going to change unless it's some type of accountability that's set in stone. If, if we're not intentional with the accountability metrics to ensure that you know we're chasing those indicators that if you want to increase representation, for example, the PO, uh, if we want to have more black representation, there's nothing stopping the PO from setting up, you know, mm -hmm. an agenda saying that, you know, this is our target, this is exactly we're gonna go, this is like exactly how we're gonna achieve those targets, right? And and that there's nothing stopping for any organization, be it at the provincial mm -hmm. level or the federal level. Uh, from pursuing those um, items. Um, and so I think um, personally, I mean, and in my view, I think um, if, if we're gonna be chasing any equity, diversity, inclusion tactic, then um, if there's no measurement, if there's no accountability, then it's just, it's a waste of time. Uh, but I think on our point again, and I'm gonna go back to uh, what Kwame mentioned in terms of organizing, I believe in the power of organizing and coming together. And it's the only way we can really, uh, you know, enhance those voices at those levels we want to see change. And the problem that we have obviously with organizing is first of all, we have to contend with a lack of representation. So if the PO does not have enough uh, representation, then we need to organize enough, well enough to do what perhaps Ron is doing and going to the schools and encourage those young boys and young girls and others to um, perhaps pursue that pipeline within <clears throat> engineering because we know at the education level or the educational institution they're not really doing it or they're not pursuing it so unfortunately it, it this this weight is left on our shoulders and if we want to make these changes every single one of us has to put in and ask ourselves what are we doing to make those changes and it could be something as simple as uh, bringing black professionals together or uh, being a part of a mentorship program at a university i do actually do some mentorship programs at uh i'm going to be doing one for us in this summer and I've also done one for uh, York University. I'm an alumni of York. And so um, that's something that I think we should be part of and including even within the, um, our kids' schools. 
um, be that represent be the representation that that's that's cool needs to ensure that we can enhance those voices. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm cognizant of the time and I know we've gone overboard, but it's not time wasted. Yeah. It's been a very good session and I and I I'm, I'm excited about what we've been able to achieve within that time frame. But mm -hmm. I'd want to discuss one more question. So we're gonna to have to skip skip one of them, but I'll go to the last one. I mean, what role does engineering play in breaking barriers in both industry and community? And I can think of so many, but I'm sure with your experience, I'm sure you can share some. I'll take this back to Ron and then we're gonna wrap it up. Just just so I understand the question, clearly you're saying that what role will we play in the uh, in the industry? Is that, is that what you're saying? No, what role does engineering play in breaking barriers? So, I mean... Oh, in breaking barriers, okay. Yeah, what role does engineering um, it's... play in breaking barriers in both industry and community? And I can only imagine, only if we had a lot more Black representation within engineering. Can you imagine yeah. what we would have achieved today in 2021? Uh, yeah. That's, that's what <laughs> you know? Who knows these systems were put in place 500 years ago. Yeah. So I can only imagine if we had allowed that opportunity to people equally from the get-go, we could yeah. have achieved so much. Those things that you know your colleagues can see that you're able to see, right? So I'll take this yeah. back to you. One of the things that we have to recognize is that, um, you know, we talk about normal and abnormal, some things that are abnormal. And one of the things that is, is not normal is the, um, the way the Black people deal with struggles, the way Black people respond when their back is against the wall. Um, it is not normal. Um, going back to what Juan was talking about, a lot of the stuff in Black history that we were the, um, the forefront, forerunners or the, the inventors of these things um, when we were faced with challenging and coming up with solutions. So you find that you find that if we were given the opportunity to present ourselves on a consistent basis right across the engineering profession um, we will be because we are going to stand out that's one of the things that they don't want and we have to keep that in mind we have to keep in mind that when we touch something there is some level of exemplary performance that goes with it. We have to acknowledge that. So one of the things we have to let our young Black kids understand is that you're going to do something and it's going to stand out and you have to learn how to deal with that. And we have all had this where you walk into a room for the first time and they start the introduction and they said, this is Matthew Davis. You said, I'm Matthew Davis and I'm the ex-engineer. And you see the look on the faces. We have all gotten that look, you know, that same look Kwame's talking about when you put on a suit. We have all gotten that look, that look that says, holy shit, he's a black engineer, <laughs> right? So we have to let our black young professional understand you're going to get that look. You're going to experience that. And you're going to let understand that you're going to be held to a higher level of performance, but it's not nothing that you can do. In fact, it will eventually become your norm in terms of how you, you operate, right? I've had the, the, the opportunity of teaching. I think I was doing a count the other day and it was up to 1,200 students at the University of Toronto Project Management for the past almost 10 years. And I can count, I recall, there were about three black engineers. A lot of my students are engineers because they want to hear the engineer's perspective of project management. And there were only three. And one was a girl, a young lady from Africa. Uh, well, she's from African descent and she works with um, Electra now, which was Hydro One uh, Branton. And I remember she given me the same experience that that you talk about where the student counselor was telling her, <laughs> the guidance counselor was telling her that, you know, it's, it's as if you're black, you're not supposed to be able to do math. That's, first of all, being a female and being able to do math was a, was, a, was a big thing. And then being black and doing that. So we have to understand, we have to let them understand that you can do it. And this is what you're gonna experience. Because a lot of the things that we're seeing is out of fear as well. There is a level of fear that is, provided to these young youngsters that let them don't want to do certain things. 
and we have to overcome that as well, right? The other thing that I would like to contribute here is whatever we're doing, we must call it black. We cannot call it diversity. We cannot call it anything else. It must be called black. If it's black professional engineering, if it's black, it has to be black because this is what I've seen. And that's my spiel on that, sorry. That's fair enough. Um, yep, so in, um, you gotta be intentional with whatever targets you're going after. Very intentional, very, very if intentional. If you're looking for to enhance black representation, then you gotta call it black representation. If you're looking yeah. to enhance uh, gender diversity, that's got to be called as gender diversity and so forth. And, and I'm all for that. Um, I mean, at least from an equity, diversity and inclusion perspective, um, it includes all races. Uh, but then again, if there's a race that's highly underrepresented then, and the organization wants to pursue black representation, there's nothing wrong with calling it like it is. It is black representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily sit well with others, especially within the organization context. And I get it because of organizational politics, you name it, yeah, yeah. can be a little, can put a lot of people yeah. against the wall. And I get it. Uh, but uh, yes, we have to call things like they are. And if we're increasing representation, we have to be intentional and we have to have a target. Kwame, I want to hear your thoughts on that last question. What role does engineering play in breaking barriers in both industry and community? Well, by definition, engineering is problem solving. Um, if you're in a solution-based problem-solving modality, it's always better to have the people who are in the thick of things come up with a solution. So if we're facing challenges in our community, vis-a-vis -vis if it's a road issue, a drainage issue, whatever it is, the people who are living in that community are the ones experiencing it and would be able to come up with more uh, equitable um, solutions that affect them the most, um, so if uh, engineering uh, is targeted to people within the affected communities and the engineering community, engineering education, engineering professionals, reach out to that, those affected communities and have them see how community, how engineering can be, a, uh, can be an instrument of change. It will significantly affect community. And you know that uh, people take ownership of things. So if you have a part to play in, um, in for the solution, you will want to protect it more. And I'll just give a quick anecdote. Um, I go to Africa a lot um, because it gives me solace. And I feel... Uh, uh, specifically, I go to Ghana specifically. I've gone to two African countries in 20 years, 10 years. And I go to mainly Ghana. And uh, um, we had saw a need for um, <clears throat> uh, community toilets. And what we found is that because we came in, we tried to engage with community, but I don't think we, the, the, the angle by which we went to engage was through the chieftaincy. And he was disliked by the community and we didn't know that. And it, uh, the result we got, sure we got the toilet done and people are using the toilet, but I don't see the ownership of it as I'd like to see. So that's what engineering should do. It needs to get on the ground, engage the people who are facing the problem, show them how engineering can make a difference and in, in the engineering making the difference, it might encourage them to go into engineering so that the engineers solving the problem when the problems comes up are the people from the community. All right. Thank you. And uh, that's a nice way to put it. Um, you can only imagine if we didn't have engineering in the world, uh, we'd be full of problems. Yeah. I can only imagine if we had a lot more representation in engineering, especially from black professionals, how many uh, problems we would have resolved by now. So um, I'd want to hear your thoughts, uh, Matthew. Yeah, I think uh, Kwame sort of stole my thunder with that um, that last one, but that's that's okay. I'll just try to build on to it quickly. Um, I think in addition to what he said, um, engineering helps to define these problems, like you say, like in communities. Mm -hmm. um, I work for the city, so for so for example, um, uh, if you're in a room full of engineers or planners and 
you know, there's there's some plans out there to do some big infrastructure project. Um, me as an engineer of color, right? I look at these things a bit differently than maybe some of the other engineers who come from different backgrounds. And so the question is for, I'll just give you this example to kind of build again of what Kwame was saying. Um, if, you know, if a government is going to be spending a lot of money and they want to, you know, on a particular uh, infrastructure project and they want to say that they're targeting, you know, specific communities and whatnot, the question is, and the question will always be, does that community really need that, right? Like you're, you, you're designing and planning at like this level, but the people that are actually living the real life experience are, are, are at the street level, right? I'll just use streets as an example. And so engineering as a role, has a role to play in that because the people a lot of times who are at the street level don't know about the things that are being planned at this high level. And then the next thing you know, some years later, people are showing up with you know construction equipment and saying, we're about to change everything, right? So there, there, I think the role, I can tell you the role that I play in, in my role is in, here in the city is that I try to be the go-between between what these high sort of level planning and you know, budgeted things and program things for the next 10 years are and try to bring them to the level to, to actually get to people and say, you know, this is what people are trying to tell you is, is wrong. What, what do you really think is wrong? And redefine the problem so that there's a positive feedback going back up to the planning and the programming and the budgeting, right? I think that without uh, engineers that like, like my background or others, that, that doesn't happen. And you end up throwing what I always call, if you ever heard me speak publicly, I always say, I hate throwing good money after bad, right? If we've done a lot of things around here where mm -hmm. in the past, I mean, I can talk about, you know, uh, the whole idea of folks having to relocate out of like downtown Toronto for the gardener and where they ended up having to live and the generational injuries that happened after that. Like I could, that's a whole different conversation. But if I'm doing that, Again, why would I look at money and programs and things that are supposed to benefit a community when you haven't even solved the original thing that set that community off in the first place, right? So again, I'm, I'm gonna get off my soapbox because this is this is this is part of the reason why I work at the city is because I really do want to affect that change as an engineer. So to Kwame's point, it's solving problems, but I believe we are very well positioned to be agents of social change. Um, if and whenever we get the opportunity. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, you wrapped it up in such a nice way that uh, there's nothing for me to add on that. Um, and so, um, you know, we're coming up to the end of the uh, forum and I wanna thank you again for coming on to the forum and exchanging your perspectives and, and insights on, especially in engineering or as black professionals in engineering. Um, and um, a few things that I just wanna mention is that um, Beginning of uh, April, I did uh, start a new network. It's called the Black Canadian Professionals Network. Uh, the intention of this uh, network is to connect uh, Black professionals across Canada, uh, from coast to coast to coast. Uh, in my previous role uh, in my corporate world, I did a lot of traveling across across the landscape, uh, especially right across North America, and um, I came across many Black professionals. And I'd, I'd want to make sure that I could connect those unique Black experiences together. And so when it comes to a situation where we want to gather Black professionals across different industries on one platform, that's a key that um, I'm hoping that we can achieve on this platform, on that specific platform. And um, after the forum, I'm going to make sure I send each, each and every one of you a link to the uh, platform as well. And the hope there is to ensure that um, we can uh, come together and have that collective experience and, and empower voices and um, the only way we can uh, get people to listen to our experiences and our realities is by collectively doing it together. And um, I want to make sure that we can connect um, all those little block initiatives that you have across the landscape, be it in IT, in HR, in, in engineering. I want to make sure I can bring all of them together in, in a way that people understand that there are so many block professionals across the landscape and there's so many opportunities for us to, uh, to maximize on that potential and work together. And um, I'm interested to see how that grows as well. 
Um, and um, I'm, I'm encouraged by seeing, um, you know, black professionals uh, in engineering in this trade and hearing uh, a lot more about your stories. And I'm hoping that uh, this is perhaps an inspiration to uh, someone younger that's probably trying to get into engineering. And, uh, um, you know, when they have and see these experiences, it becomes telling, it's telling for them. And it's, um, they may be inclined to just uh, pursue that, uh, that profession that they were perhaps discouraged to pursue uh, within, um, uh, by their guidance counselor in this case, whatever they may be, right? Um, so uh, to wrap it up, um, I'm gonna leave it up, uh, open it up to closing thoughts. Uh, maybe you can go around one more round and, and we'll call it a good night. Uh, I'll take it back to Ron. Okay, I'm here. Yeah, um, it was. It's 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 been a pleasure, um, you know, participating in these events. Um, I, I myself am swamped in terms of time. I you know generally at this time, um, well at this time next Thursday I'll be actually lecturing because <laughs> my classes run from seven to 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 eight thirty on Thursday nights. But um, I'm always um, you know one of the things that I've I've resort I would say reserve resolve resolve myself to is. Um, you know, there comes a point in time when you tend to you, you figure out what is your purpose, right? And um, Kwame talked about traveling to Africa and all that. But I identified it probably about 10, 10, 11 years ago, I identified that my purpose in this life is to help people grow and develop. And I've helped a lot of people grow and develop and it's, it comes natural to me. And I've seen the gaps especially when it comes down to black professionals. I remember coming off the train downtown Toronto, you know, walking from Union Station to King and Young and counting how many black professionals I can think of. Well, not even, I'm just assuming they're professional because, you know, based on how they're attired. And I remember a couple of mornings, you know, it's like one or two. And even if they're not professionals, just black people, in the downtown business core in the morning. Like if you were to just count it, it's not a lot. It's really not a lot compared to the thousands of people you're walking amongst. So that kind of reassured, you know, it kind of reassured me that, you know, there's a huge gap here. There's a significant gap here. And um, whatever I can do to help, I try to, you know, use my time sparingly to help. I find that we have to start with the young black people. Although I'm a professional engineer, but the young black guys and boys and girls who I, you know, may not necessarily want to aspire to do, be an engineer, I deal with the trades all, all the time and I can tell them. Nobody tells them this. Nobody tells them that every time you see a bucket chuck and guys goes up and they throw these yellow things over the high voltage wire, nobody tells them those guys make $70 an hour. Nobody tells them that the elevator mechanic makes $56 an hour. Nobody tells them these things. So they, they, are, they are totally misguided. You can become a professional electrical, licensed electrical in five years and making $40, $50 an hour. Nobody tells them that. So what I try to guide them is look at the profession which you see is predominantly. When you're driving on the street, when you're on the bus, just look and see where you see the predominant the white man. That's where the milk and honey is and nobody's gonna tell you. They're not gonna come and tell you that that's where the milk and honey is. So we need to do a better job at that. And I'm more than willing to be a part of this. And, you know, I really appreciate it. I've never met Kwame before. I never met Matthew before. I never met you before, Kevin. Um, so it was a, it's a real pleasure to, you know, anytime I get an opportunity to network with my fellow Black professionals, it is always, for me, it's, it's always something that I welcome. When you're out there and you're the only one in that boardroom, you're, you're, you're the only one in these meetings. It, it can be a frightening and lonely place. Nobody talks about that part, but psychology, psychologically, it can be a frightening and lonely place. I'm going to leave it at that, but this is what we need to get for young Black people. And that's why I say, be purposeful, call it Black. Thank you. Nice way to end it. Uh, Kwame, your thoughts? It just, yeah, so um, I have a request for you. 
I'm wondering if you can do a social media blast with these things. So that's how you get to the young people. And I'm sure they'll be impressed by seeing so many people that look like them that are doing these yeah. wonderful and amazing things in Canada. Because if you don't see yourself in that position, you don't see the effect that people like you are making. For example, Matthew mm -hmm. works with the city. These guys are doing infrastructural changes. They're, yeah. um, where I live here, they're putting a new uh, streetcar. I'm at Finch and Islington. They're putting the streetcar there. And this is a whole, this is, I always respect the, the transportation guys and the heavy civil guys, because what they do is nothing but amazing. If you think about yeah. it, putting a tunnel on the ground and locating it so you miss all the foundations or shoring up all the foundations that are in the way. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, un it's unbelievable. All the vibrational forces that I could go on and on and all these guys know Ke Kevin of what's involved in doing that. So if they can see that, I think it would be great. Uh, second thing I'd like to say is that people love money more than they hate us. So when we get in there and they recognize yep. that people make them a lot of money, you got the yep. job. Right. Yeah. We just need to get our shoe in the door. And if we can mm -hmm. show the young people that with our experiences, I mean, I've survived 23 years in this construction business and wherever I end up working, I am I am so sad that when I was in school and getting all the stress of engineering weighted down on you. And as I don't know what you guys experience are, were, but as people of color, we have 10,000 things that we are considered considering mm -hmm. outside of just being in school. <clears throat> the rent you have to come up with some of the school fee this that everything yep, is yep. on top of your back right and i remember we had a course called introduction to civil engineering and the man stand up there and he says we got you into this program because we know you can do it that's why you're here but here are the things that are going to let you fail you live far from school i'm thinking i live far enough <laughs> you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend i thought you didn't have a girlfriend so i check that one out you got personal problems. I'm like, yeah, I got lots of those. You have a part-time job, right? And you have, <laughs> he said, you're going to fail. Are you sitting there checking off all these things, right? But he said another thing that I wish I had listened to it and use it. And I actually listened to it and use it in my professional life. He said, do not do seat of the pants management. Yeah. Say it again. Do not do seat of the pants management. If we can get this out to the young people or even other black professionals, the mm -hmm. way you're going to differentiate yourself from everybody else is don't do seat of the pants management. If there is a thing you're working on and the time horizon is this amount and you plan it from back here, when you start, you're just executing that plan that you spent three, four months planning. Once you start running with it, it's you, you'd be surprised if you're just checking off all the pieces to keep the, the engine running, right? So in summarization, I'm saying, again, this was amazing. I am in construction, so I see and know the salaries of all these trade person. They make, all, the average tradesman is making six figures. The average trade man make way more money and the guy that's down on Bay Street with his jacket and tie. So and before you choose that career, if you're going to do this, you have to go to the end. While you're going to study engineering, you do four years, you can come out and somebody will hire you. Because I always advise the engineering students, if you're going to take a master's, get a job first. Yes. Because yeah. you come up with your four years, and we at Ryerson, we take 60 courses up over four years. So we span the whole gamut from transportation, structural, soils. Mm -hmm. So you know, the guy can place you anywhere and he can train you. If you come out and you specialize in soil mechanics, well, after four, no, six years, you're only gonna be, you're gonna be pigeonholed and your experience is only gonna be in soil mechanics. Soil mechanics. Right? So this is where we come in as the professionals in the field that we can steer them in that path. And I will digress and stop it there before I say too much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kwame. Thanks for sharing. I know we've gone way over time. Um, give Matthew a chance to uh, put in his closing thoughts and we'll call it a good night. Sure. So first, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and kind of share these experiences with other Black engineers. It's uh, very far and few between the kind of opportunities to have this. So thank you.
And thanks to you both, Kwame and, and, and Ronald, for uh, all of your insights. I learned, I feel like I learned a bunch even from these two. So, uh, you know, I'll be taking my mental notes and going back over this recording uh, when, when it once it's posted. Um, the only things I think I would add, um, I'll start, I guess I'll, I'll just say like this, for folks that are trying to really get into engineering, uh, especially if you're a black engineer, um, I'm just gonna speak sort of, so I guess more from a realistic perspective. It's a struggle and you gotta be prepared for that struggle. And unfortunately for many of us being black, it's not just the struggle of becoming an engineer, but it's just a struggle to live at each, each and every day. So <laughs> recognizing that, understand that if you're willing to go through the struggle, you know, the rewards on the other end can be almost endless. Right. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because where I grew up, um, you know, I grew up in a place where, you know, a lot, not a lot of people get out. Right. If you want to call it a hood or whatever, whatever it is you want to call it. And there were people who I went to high school with who said, oh, you're going to college. Man, no, I, I'm just going to go in and get this job because I can't be broke for four years, you know, um, and they're still broke now 20 years later. Right. Whereas, you know, I can make a living for my family. Right. So I, I want to point that out because there's a lot of people who think that, uh, first of all, being smart is not cool. You're the nerdy guy in the class. You know, you really got to put that aside because it is cool as hell to be black and smart. Right. And yeah, yeah. you can take a, you can take it and get a lot of other places that you wouldn't be able to if you want to be one of the cool kids that want to get C's, D's and F's or whatever grading system, you know, you, you go by. So I, I, I want to say all these things because these are the things that we don't understand as older engineers sometimes that these are, these sound silly, but these are the pressures that a lot of these younger folks are under. There's the struggle piece. And then there's the whole idea of not fitting in, not being cool because I'm smart, right? And then th there's this other part where they don't, you know, th the whole saying, you can't be what you can't see, right? If you can't, see yourself succeeding and being out there, then you're not going to do it, right? So I guess I'm just putting this all out there just for tidbits and for hopefully some nuggets of, of encouragement for people who are looking in to get into the field that, you know, yes, I think all of us on this panel have had our struggles. Like, don't believe that just because we're sitting here talking to you as licensed engineers or engineers with 20 or 30 years experience that we didn't go through our own struggles. You are going to go through yours. Right, but at the end of the day, this is this is the other thing. I two other things I learned. Um, what people, what someone told me a long time ago, because I was struggling to get my license in the U.S. and, and I ended up getting ten licenses after a while because I was a consultant, so I had to you know do what I had to do. Someone told me, he said, your name is is uh, how you live, but the initials after your name is how you make your living, and I never ever forgot that. And the reason why I bring it up is because you get that, you know, degree, right? You want to put BSE or MSC or whatever. That's how you're going to heart start to make your living. You get PNG after your name, right? That's the way you're going to start making your living. And a lot of Black folks don't get and don't understand unless someone like all, all of us start to tell them. It's so important to get that paper, to get the credentials, right? You're already Black. You're starting at a spot that is behind most other people. The only thing that's gonna put you anywhere near the tables you need to be sitting at, that degree, that license, right? Or that certification that proves that you have done everything the same way everyone else around that table has. And in some cases, you've done even more. So I would just leave everyone with that, that yes, it's a struggle, understand that, understand that there, there are things that you can achieve and you will achieve them if you put you know, your mind into it. Trust me, I, I'm sure we could all tell our sob stories of the crosses we had to bear to get to where we're at. But the idea that you will come to do a practice and you wanna make a change and you get into a field like engineering and don't get that degree and don't get that license, you're wasting your time, right? Don't be somebody's tech. That's the thing, that's another thing that one of my professors told me. Is that don't go through all these classes just to be an engineering tech. No disrespect to engineering techs, I love them. But it's like, if again, if uh, I think Ronald, you said it, right? If you're going to school and you only need a year or two more 
to be somebody's supervisor. Just do it. We need more Black folks in the supervisory and managerial levels of these technical fields, right? You build your technical skills up for a long time, and then you become that person that directs other people. We don't have that. And I just feel like, I'm just putting these messages out here, Kevin, because I feel like if, if we don't combine a lot of what we said today to some of these sort of real world, like, you know, facts about the way to get into engineering, people will still remain discouraged. And they'll see all the struggle and say it's not worth it. But it is worth it. You just have to have all these goals put in front of you and know that you can achieve them. So I'll just leave it at that. It's a nice way to end it. And thanks for sharing that. And I couldn't agree more. I want to thank all of you again for joining us on this panel in the 15th episode. And I'm looking forward to uh, uh, many more opportunities of our interactions. And I'm hoping that uh, you've learned something new tonight. I have. I know. I have. And uh, it's, it's always glad to meet people for the first time. And I do this on every single forum. I make it, um, it's intentional when I, I don't uh, do a lot of networking before the forum because I wanna get to learn the people through the forum. And um, I, I think it's always a great way to discover you know, what Ron's doing, what Kwame's doing, what Matthew's doing. And it's a great way of keeping that conversation going and exploring and looking at exactly what those experiences have been and how I can relate them to myself as well. Uh, once again, thanks for joining us, and um, it's always great to have Black professionals in our forum, and I'm looking forward to many more opportunities, and I'll be sending you links. I'm hoping all of you can get a chance to connect, and I'm sure you're going to find many more opportunities amongst yourselves as well. Let's keep connecting, and uh, stay safe, and have a good night. Thank you. Bye now. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.